Uh, thanks, Narendra. Okay, all right. So I would like to wish everyone a very good morning. Uh, I hope uh, you would have a general discussion uh, uh, before I enter into this session. So uh, I just wanted to know that if you guys have any general queries uh, before we get started with the session. The main agenda of this session is to uh, revise the contents from week one to week eight. So generally what we do is uh, we just walk through the mock paper as the mock papers are themselves designed in such a way that uh, they cover all of the concepts uh, between weeks one to eight. So we hope that uh, it is going to revise or do a revision for all of the concepts that are recently covered in those lectures. But still, if there is any question remaining for you guys, maybe you can just put it later once you finish working through the mock. Hello. Yeah, Abhishek got disconnected. He'll join in a minute. My phone is multiple times. Yeah, you can pass the multiple parameters. So the only thing that you'll have to use the the, the colon twice. Like, I'll write it in the chat. It's slash API slash post. Like, IT. I should not use the ID twice. I mean, you can say that one should be a post ID and the user ID. There should be some name in the, the difference in the name. But if you want to pass two, uh, two uh, like variables, you can do like this. All you have to, whenever you are passing a variable, you need to use the double use the colon so the params parameter is like a object so you can pass two objects so whenever you are using the router dot push then inside the router dot push you use the param right that param parameter it's kind of the router dot 
you pass the object to the router dot push and inside that object there is a parameter called params and that in that it that itself a object and in there you can pass two parameters so let's say one is post post id and second is user id then inside the params params write this post id parameters I think query parameters, right? Uh, but I will try both of them. I'll try the path part also. But I think more of query parameters. I think I want to pass them as parameters so that the, the called route will use them. I think uh, um, Narendra has answered them saying, you know, like basically, typically we keep passing user ID from between different components, right? And other things. So he's given a chat answer also. I think that will work. I'll try that out. Okay. okay. With your mock things, sir, then I can we can come to this question later. Okay, so okay. this is a specific part. So I'll just quickly share my screen and uh, we'll start with a uh, mock QP that is already available on the portal. But before we get started, or meanwhile, I'm uh, sharing my screen. Uh, has anyone tried solving that mock exam before? And if you have, did you face any difficulties? The first one I could not solve. <laughs> I think it was quite uh, very detailed. So the first question was, uh, I think you'll start with that question. Definitely face quite a bit of questions, uh, a bit of difficulty in that. Later, I could execute it on my own. I do it, but just walking through, it got very confusing. Okay, all right. Yes, sir, I saw uh, So is my... uh, Yeah, sorry. I saw the mock question. It was like doable. Okay, okay, they were doable. Right. Did you face any difficulty while solving those? No, sir. Okay, great. Nice to hear that. Okay. Uh, so the first question is uh, related to the promise. Okay. What is difficult in this question? Uh, new promise, resolve, reject. Uh, then we have a set timeout here. And then we have this chain of them blocks here. And what we are asking is, we are asking to predict the output after 10 seconds. So predicting the output after 10 seconds, uh, what will happen is, okay. So uh, whenever the promise gets resolved, so definitely means the promise is going to resolve because we are not rejecting this promise anywhere. Uh, so after some time, this promise will resolve and we are resolving this promise with the message statement one. So the moment this promise gets resolved, the control will go to this then block. What will happen when the control is uh, inside this then block? It is going to show this statement, that is statement two or this message on the console. And after that, what it does is it simply returns the message that the promise has, the dot, uh, has resolved with. And uh, that message was statement one. So statement one is the message or that string that is being returned uh, in the form of R variable here. And this R will be received as a parameter here in the next then block in this same chain. So this R is representing that message, that is statement one. And now we are uh, printing that uh, statement one or that message on the console. So the order of output till now is statement two. After that, we'll get statement one. Since this then block is not returning anything, so if it does not return anything, that means it is returning undefined. That means the next then block in the chain is going to get the value undefined. And it is going to display the same. So the order of outputs will be statement two, statement one, and undefined. So what does the 2000 uh, error time of that is doesn't have any effect on this, right? Uh, one second. Because he's asked about after one second. That is why I think the confusion came because it asked about the question asking about what will happen after 10 seconds. 10 seconds, yes. 
so i'm not able to understand is there any specific issue with this 10 seconds crazy the, the set time out right the fact that the time out will expire after 2 minutes so two seconds has no impact on the order right mm-hmm. or when will the then block be called will it be called after 2 seconds only the first the then block will be called up okay wait 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 okay so here is a catch uh, so if you are able to see the set time out definition so what is happening here is that you are calling this resolve function what is the general format or what is the general convention of using this set time out function is that we pass the callback here now when we are passing the callback function what we do is we just pass the function reference okay we don't call that function at that place itself but here since we are passing a parameter here we are using this uh, set of parentheses that means we are invoking this function right here so in that case what will happen is okay understood so this 2000 seconds oh, sorry not 2000 seconds 2000 milliseconds what impact on this portion output in any way because the moment this promise gets created it will be resolved right away and statement 2 1 and uh, and defined will be shown right away on the screen nothing uh, the program is not going to wait for 2 seconds in order to show this up the reason is that we are calling this resolve function immediately we are not passing it as a callback here but we are invoking this function is that okay yes sir so that is saying that was a confusion okay thank you for that that's why i spent quite a lot of time on the i wrote it on my own outside after the finishing the mark but i still couldn't figure out why it is working that way thank you okay Okay, so uh, these are some general conventions that we should keep in our mind because many a times we don't even you know notice these small things. But yes, we generally pass callbacks here. Callbacks means we just pass the function reference. We don't invoke those functions right there. Okay, so even if we just you know exclude this, let's say we are simply writing R E S here. Ah, uh, in that case we won't be able to pass the statement one, of course. So what can happen is. in that case the output will definitely change because we want to have this message statement 1 in that case the output would be statement 2 and then we'll get here uh, that will be undefined and again so in case we are not passing this statement 1 as a parameter and we are just using this res that is resolve function as a callback the output will be statement 2 statement 1 oh, sorry statement 2 undefined and undefined and that output will be shown after waiting for 2 seconds or 2000 milliseconds because that time the set time out has to finish its execution before the resolve function can be invoked or can be put into the call stream okay so uh, the answer or the correct answer for this particular question is going to be the fourth one no sorry not fourth one third one it's statement two right okay it is going to be third i hope it is clear shall we move to the next question Okay, I guess yes. Ah, uh, so consider the following JavaScript program and predict the output if executed. So we are just creating an array here, and after that we are deleting an element. And what we are showing is we are showing the length of that array. Ah, uh, and then we are showing what is the element that is present at index two. Okay, so what happens is when we use this delete operator, so this is going to create a hole. Now creating a hole means that the index does not have any value, but it will still be counted in the length or when we are computing the length of the array so the length of this array will remain unchanged however if you will try to access the value that is stored at that particular index that you have just deleted that is 2 it is going to give you undefined so in that case the length will remain the same that is 5 and the uh, value at ar2 will be undefined so it is going to be 5 undefined Okay, I guess this is what we studied in the first uh, a couple of weeks when we were uh, you know, studying JavaScript. That what are holes and how they are created. The length of the array doesn't change if there are multiple holes present in the array. So, all right, this seems to be an easy one. So, which of the following is are not is are not keywords in the JavaScript language? Uh, array. Do you think that array is a keyword in JavaScript? No, so no was my guess. Yeah. Okay, it is not what I was for. For is there? For yeah, we there. use for loops, so for is definitely there. What about continue? 
to be MCN, I wasn't first, sure. I, I didn't try it. <laughs> I didn't click it. Okay. But the typically before there's always a break and right? yes. So continue existence must be like it does in other languages. And then we have this undefined. Uh, what do you think about uh, undefined? Undefined is a yeah, so the it's not is a keyword. It's not a keyword, right? I can't use it directly as such. Yeah, it is not a keyword, I guess. Okay, it is not a keyword. Then what is it? We have studied that undefined is also a data type in JavaScript language. Right, undefined and null are two different data types. Yes, but I can't set anything to that, right? It just happens to be that way. So it is somehow I thought it was like automatically <laughs> put the undefined value that the thing is defined. But uh, okay. the keyword is I can't use that as on the on the left hand side or in, as by itself anywhere in the program. Okay, let's try to. Oh, I guess sir, this is a primitive value uh, in JavaScript. Yeah, this is also a primitive value. Yes. Uh, okay, let's do one thing. Let us try defining a variable with the name undefined. Uh, what do you think? What is going to happen? Sir, your console is not visible. Uh, I can see only browser. My console is not visible. Is it? Okay, just a... Is it visible now? Yes. Okay, yeah. So I have just written here a simple JavaScript statement. I'm creating a variable with a name undefined and I'm assigning it the value to be 10. Do you think that statement will successfully execute or it will generate an error? Or if it does, will I be able to? Mm -hmm. Sorry, if it does not generate an error, will I be able to use this undefined variable as an identifier? I think we should be able to do it. Okay, so the moment I hit enter, so I am getting an error here that is undefined has already been declared. Okay, so that means I'm not able to use it as an identifier here, but still it's not a keyword, right? Okay, uh, let us do one more interesting thing. Uh, what will I do is, is my browser screen visible now? Yes, sir. Uh, let us just open any online JavaScript compiler and let us see that how does it behave. So if I run it, see it uh, ran without any error. I'm clicking on run. It is running without giving any error. However, when I'm trying to do it on the browser console, it is not allowing me to do so. That means undefined is already defined uh, in the browser console. Maybe yes. some property or globally. Yes, correct. And if I try to you know, log this value, let's say console.log undefined. What do you think the output to be? Or what do we expect the output to be? Should be 10. No? It should be 10, yes. So, so uh, yeah, so, uh, one question here. Let's say uh, you have changed the definition of undefined here as to be 10. So yes. whenever we will define some variable without initializing some value to it, it will give 10 or it will just give undefined again? It will give undefined. See, let's do that. Uh, let's create another variable, say b. So that thing won't change. It will still remain undefined. But here the point is that we are able to use undefined as an identifier and we are not able to use it as an identifier in a browser console. Can anyone guess the reason or guess why is it happening? Uh, 
that's why it's a reserved value right so basically something that cannot be uh, you know the no, program it's not a reserved can... value. okay or okay uh, i may be is putting that, it is that keywords are also a kind of some keywords you you cannot use them in your program okay so uh, does anyone remember that uh, in one of the sessions we discussed the difference uh, between how a javascript program is executed in a rappel environment or uh, and in a script environment does anyone remember that discussion mm, yes sir so that uh, difference is basically making the point here if you are just trying uh, to find out what is happening uh, just think about uh, the discussion that we had that day and you will be able to find out the reason okay let me just try to give you a very quick recap what we discussed that day is that when we are trying to run a program in a script mode so what it does is it basically takes all of the code that you have written in the script and just it just puts that as a definition to a function and it executes that in a function scope based or a function scoped environment so what actually happens is that let's say what i do is i create a function here so this is a function now whatever code that i am writing here in a script environment or whenever i am trying to execute a program as a script so whatever code that i will be writing here let's say this is the whole code that i am trying to execute as script what it does is it simply copies this and it puts it inside this function body okay and it executes this function after that what it does is it's let's say this uh, something that like uh, okay, any random object say obj that i can declare somewhere and yeah that's it so this is what we discussed that day that whenever you write any program in a script or try to execute a program as a script what happens is the code that you write is being copied to a function and that function is being invoked with an empty object context because if you remember that when when do we use this call function we use it to provide uh, an a context right to that function or uh, to provide the value of this to be precise so here the value of this is what the value of this is obj that's why uh, this inside this uh, what i say these functions is uh, basically the behavior of that this reference changes every time whenever we use this call function and we provide a different context now i will try to relate it with the current point that we are discussing here so since we are saying that whatever code we are writing is being executed in a function based environment so when i am trying to execute it in a browser so browser is what browser is basically a rappel environment that means whatever i am writing here is not going to be put into a function body that will be executed as it is okay that means we can say that undefined is probably uh, you know some property that is already defined in the global scope because when we were trying to execute it in the browser console we were getting an error that it has already been declared somewhere so what we can find out is or uh, the inference that we can take out from there is that there is a property undefined that is declared somewhere in that scope now in order to find out that is that uh, problem still exist when we try to execute a program as a script and when we try to do so it is not happening that means we are not getting the same error that means that variable that we were using there of course the name is undefined is some property that is defined in the global scope right because right now this is not in the global scope what is the scope the scope is basically of a function because all of this code will be put inside a function and that function will be executed so this means is that undefined is a property in the global scope that's why you cannot use it in the global scope however if you want to use it inside functions then you can do so so i'll just delete this once again so i was defining undefined variable here i was giving it some value that is 10 and i was able to show it on the console too whenever i am running this program now i'll get back to my browser console and now what will i do here is i'll create a function let's say function abc and in that function i will create that variable that is undefined 
undefined equals to 10 or let's say this time value 20. And after that, what I do is I just say console.log that is added. In the next statement, uh, what happened? Mm. Okay, so yeah. Now, if I will be invoking this ABC function here, so what happens is I will be getting the value 20. This time I'm not getting any error. I even declared this undefined variable, but this time I have done it inside a function. And since here the scope is different, that means it is creating a local variable to this function. It is not using the variable or the property that exists in the global scope with name undefined. It is not making use of that property, but it is creating a local variable to this function. And that's why we are able to use it as an identifier or as a variable here. So the same behavior will be there if I just put it within uh, the set brackets, right? If you make it a block also, the same behavior will apply because there's a separate scope for the block. Uh, if you do so, then yes, definitely you will be able to do so. So if I create a block here uh, and you I can just copy paste from above, no? Okay, same. Fine. Put it here and yeah. I will be able to get it there. Yes, so have you understood this thing? That undefined can be called as a property that is defined somewhere in the global object. So that's why you cannot directly access it in the global scope. But if you are changing the scope, then you can use that name as an identifier. So that's why it is not a keyword. Keyword is something that you cannot use anywhere in the program. Uh, that means that keyword already has some predefined meaning. For example, for we use that uh, in the form of a call loop. Uh, the other one was break continue. So we use all of these things with loops whenever we want in order to uh, break the execution of a loop or continue some iteration or something. Okay, is that thing clear? If that is clear, I guess we can move to the next question. Yes, sir. So I have come back to the seek portal. I hope uh, the seek screen is now visible. Okay, so here the answer would be not keyword. So for and continue are keywords, undefined is not a keyword. So once we have find out the answer that array is not uh, one of the or array is one of the correct answers for this question, and since this question is an MSQ, so I guess uh, for and continue everyone will be able to guess that this, these are the keywords in JavaScript language. So undefined becomes obvious. But yeah, it, it it something work. which we cannot like use in any scope, right? Sorry, a keyword is something which we cannot use in any scope. Yes, yes. That means it cannot be used as an identifier. It already has a predefined name. Okay, so this question is uh, asked with respect to view. A child component has no way to directly access the properties of a parent. What do you think so? Let's say you have a view app and you are defining some components within that view app. Do you think that some components that you have defined can make use of? Uh, yeah, say, I asked this question to Narendra last session, so I know it can be. So with the okay. parent, nothing. Yeah. All right. So yeah, the first option is true. Definitely, there is uh, this parent variable, this dot dollar parent that you can use in order to access that directly. And no, sir, it is false. Is actually, can be used. It has no way. Oh, okay. We can do yeah, this job, dollar parent and get that value, right? So correct, correct. Yes. So the question says directly, right? So this is the direct way. Of course, there are some indirect ways too. You can uh, pass props and do other things. Uh, a computed property only gets triggered when at least one of its reactive dependencies change, assuming that the page re-rendering has already been completed. Sorry, not re-rendering, it's parenting. So this is basically the difference between a method and a computed property in view. That functions are something that will be triggered each time whenever you reload the port, uh, reload the page, but computed properties will only be triggered when one of its reactive dependencies change. Does not matter how many times you are refreshing the page, it is going to catch that value and is going to reuse that value as many times as it is required unless the value changes. OK, 
Okay, so this is one of the correct answers. The view directive V model is used for two-way data binding. This is, I guess, what we have seen in uh, many of our live sessions by coding for view applications. So we use V model in order to perform data by two-way data binding. That means uh, that uh, the flow is going to be bidirectional. That means data will flow flow from uh, front end to the back end and from back end to front end as well. Here, the back end I'm considering it to be a view application or the view instance. And the front end is basically the HTML part of it. So if you use this V model, let's say with a checkbox or with any input box, what happens is if you change the value of the variable that you have associated with V model using the view application, then the change can be seen in the front end too. Of course, this is due to the reactiveness that view provides, but the uh, catch comes here. That means whenever you change some value on the front end, it automatically gets changed in the back end too. So that is what we call as two-way data binding. The one-way data binding is that means you are just able to get the data from back end to the front end, like uh, we're doing V match. So one related question for the computer property. So even if we don't do, do a pre, uh, page reload, but some other property, some other dependency has changed, so it will be triggered also, right? That is also true. Yes. No? yes. So it has nothing to do with the page refresh, but it is only to do with the reactive dependency. Yes, correct. If any of the variables uh, that it is deriving from, if any of those changes, then it will be retriggered. So yeah, I guess this is the correct answer. We are asking for two statements, and yes, third statement is correct. Uh, any doubts with this specific question? OK, let us move forward. Uh, so this question is based on uh, some coding. So consider the following view application, and we have to predict what. Uh, suppose fetch request to this slash API slash courses slash 100 fails due to the network error, what will be rendered by the browser? So if you are able to read this question, definitely you don't need to read this whole HTML and all. Uh, you just simply go to wherever this fetch uh, call is being made. So we go here, and we see that API courses 100 is being made using fetch. So I hope by now you will be having an idea that uh, there are some special things that happen with fetch and that do not happen with some you know, standard HTTP request. So uh, what is that special thing about fetch is that uh, it, the promise that it uh, returns is something that does not get reject uh, in many of the cases. It only gets reject or it only gets rejected whenever there is a network failure. Even if there is a 404 or if there is some 500 error, the promise uh, returned by the fetch request or the fetch call won't be a rejected promise. It will always be resolved. But in case of a network failure, uh, the promise returned will be rejected. So the question specifically mentions that this fetch call is basically failing due to the network error. That means the promise return will fail. And if the promise return is failing, that means the control will go to the cache block. What cache block is doing is uh, this is changing some is success variable. So that must be defined somewhere. Yeah, so is success is here that is defined in the view app. So it was true initially. Now it has been made false. We have some this dot error dot code. Okay, so we have this error, uh, which is an object having two properties. One is code, the other one is message. I guess we are changing both of these properties here. So we are making the code to be unknown and message to be could not face data. So let's see that where are these properties being used on the front end? Or okay, we just need to predict the output. Uh, so here we have a course component here, and we are passing a prop with the name course itself. So this is that course component. Uh, this is where we are defining it. It is getting this course as a prop here. So what we are doing inside this component is we are showing courses, courses name, and after that we are simply showing the course name, course dot name. But one thing to note here is that we are using v if. Uh, that means the value of this if success expression or that variable it must be true for that component to render on the screen. Uh, but you will see that we have just made this if success value false. So that means this component won't be rendered on the front end. So in that case, this V else component will be rendered on the, on the browser. So this is an error component. And we are passing an error. I guess it is an object. Yes, error is an object. We are passing it as a prop. So we will go to this error component here. Uh, we'll show in H1 error.code. So error.code is going to be unknown. And uh, in the next line, we will be getting the error dot message which is going to be 
could not fetch data. So finally, the answer is going to be unknown. And in the next line, could not fetch data. Sir, yeah, one uh, very uh, stupid question. Yes. I see that if you go to the top of the HTML, I see that yeah. often in many JavaScript code. So there is like course, colon course, and course within uh, codes. Right? Yes. All these three can be different, right? There's nothing to say that these have to be the same. <laughs> yes, yes, correct. Definitely. But often they are being used the same, so that gets very confusing. What does so here the angular bracket course means it is a component. Correct. Colon this course, course means it is a prop. Yeah. And just means that yeah. is written inside courses, the property that you are passing it as a prop. Yeah, which means colon course, whatever I suppose they call it colon course one. Then yeah. within the component, I have to refer to the course one. Exactly. Yes. Right. Here also and here also. Okay. So so we can use different names, right? Why why do they do the same name? Uh, generally, this is because this is I've seen so many times. Uh, not in uh, not even our course, but wherever you see the examples, I see this being reused multiple times. Yeah. So that uh, the code becomes relevant whenever you are reading the code. The next time you understand what this prop is. Okay. So let's say if you are writing the code today and you are reading that code day after tomorrow, so it even becomes difficult for you to understand what was written that time. So yeah, we generally use these naming conventions so that it becomes easier for us to you know review that code or understand what we write, what we wrote before. All right. So shall we move to the next question? Uh, so this was question number fifth. Yeah. So I guess we can move to the sixth question. Uh, okay. So it is asking us to consider the same view application that we have seen in the previous question. So suppose the fetch request to this slash API slash courses slash under. I guess that's the same endpoint. This time it is responding with the status code as 404 and the response body to be course not found. So what will be rendered by the browser? So remember, we just discussed about fetch. The special thing with fetch is that the promise written by this fetch call does not get rejected until and unless there is a network failure. In every other case, it is going to return a result promise, even if the status code is going to be 404 or even if it is going to be 500. So now when we are going back here, this time we see that the status code that is being returned is 404. In that case, the catch block is not going to be executed. The reason is that this promise has resolved. So since that promise has resolved, the control won't enter into the catch block. So this promise will be given to this RES variable. Uh, and then we will check here. Okay, we are waiting for this uh, promise that is being returned by this REST2. And then we are checking that if the status is OK. Now, when we are returning 404, so there is a property called OK that comes with fetch. So in that case, what it is going to do is it is just going to toggle the value of this OK attribute in case the status code is not 200. So what will happen is in this case, the OK value will be made to be false. So rest dot OK will be false. That means if statement or this expression won't become true, the control will enter in the else part of it. Here we are again making its success to be false. That means that course component won't be rendered this time too. This dot error dot code is something that we are assigning it with rest dot status. So rest dot status is what? OK, so it is basically the same request. So that means it is going to be 404. And this dot error dot message is going to be internal server error. Remember that here the response body says that the message should be course not found. However, we are making the message attribute of this error object to be internal server error. And this is what the component make use of. So if you will see the error component, because in the HTML, you will see that if success value is false, so this course component won't be rendered. It will be error component, which will be rendered by the else part of it. In the error component, when we'll see here, it says print the error.code as it is, that is going to be 404. And it says to print error.message. So error.message is what? It is internal server error. It is not the response body message that was returned by the request itself. Because we are assigning something else here, does not matter what the uh, request message is. It is going to be internal server error. So in that case, the answer is going to be 404 internal server error. So 404 internal server error, fourth is going to be the correct option. Uh, any 
questions with respect to this? Nothing, sir, but I just dread these questions in the quiz because so much of scrolling up and down takes a lot of time on the, I understand we need to have this question, but that has been a thing because that thing, you can't even use the scroll wheel, right? You have to actually drag the bar and move it up and down. So it takes time in the quiz. He's right. Like it is generally difficult in a TCS portal to scroll up and down. Even uh, yeah, actually this time we have tried to you know, even see it from a candidate's view that how it appears on the candidate screen when you actually appear for the exam. So this time we have tried to keep the code snippets as small as we can, but still there will be some sort of scrolling that would be required. At this time you won't get as lengthy questions as you might have seen in the previous quizzes. Uh, the size will be somewhat less as compared to others, but yes, somewhat of scrolling will definitely be required in case you are getting any programming based questions. Programming based means uh, view related questions. And program will try to keep it as short as possible. Means if that is just a JavaScript based programming question. Okay, all right. Let's move to the next question. So yeah, for example, this. So which of the following shows the correct output after twenty seconds if the flow program is executed? Uh, so what is happening here is we have a function called promise one. We have a function called promise two. We have a function called promise all. And at last, we are invoking this promise all. So when we invoke this promise all function, what it does is okay, promise dot all. All right. So let us first uh, you know discuss about promise dot all. So what promise dot all does is it accepts an iterable, an iterable of promises. Generally, a convention is iterable of promises. Otherwise, you can even pass a uh, you know an empty iterable or whatever you want to. But an iterable generally consists of the promises. And what it does is it does a sequential evaluation of all of those promises. If all of the promises that were present in the iterable resolve, then only the promise returned by the promise.all will be resolved. So the output of this promise.all is actually a single promise that is going to be based on the promises that you have provided in the iterable. If there are 100 promises, then the output is going to be based on the 100 promises. So what happens is if all of the promises that were provided in the iterable resolves, then the promise written by this promise dot all function will also resolve in case any one of that promise does not matter. Let's say you have 100 promises and the 99th promise fails. In that case, the promise written by this all function will also uh, be rejected. Okay. So in case you want to get a result promise from this all function, you have to make sure that all of the promises that you are passing in the iterable here, they must resolve in case even one of the promise gets rejected, then the promise returned as the result by this promise.all function will also be rejected. There is another thing that you need to keep in your mind with this promise.all function is uh, the result that it returns. So right now what we are doing is we are, of course, since it returns a promise, so it should be returning some result. The result is in the same sequential order as that of promises that were defined in this iterable. That means if the uh, the data or some value returned by promise one, let's say is hello and by promise two, it is world. So what it does is uh, the output that we'll get is hello world. Does not matter even if the promise two resolves earlier than promise one. Let's say promise two resolves after one second and promise one resolves after 10 seconds. Since this promise dot all is returning a single promise, it has to wait until all of the promises resolve here. That means if it is resolving after 10 seconds and promise two is resolving after one second, it does not mean you will get the output for promise two after one second. If you are waiting for a result or an output from promise.all, you have to make sure that all of the promises that were provided in the variable have resolved, or at least one of them reject. Okay, so the sequence of output has to be maintained in the same sequence as the promises were defined in the iterable that was passed as an argument to this all function. Now, what is happening here is we are passing this promise one, we are invoking this function, and similarly, we are invoking another function promise two. So what is happening in promise one is, okay, so the, when we are calling this promise one function here, what it is essentially doing is it is eventually returning a promise here. So this promise is going to be the first element, 
and the promise returned by this promise to function is going to be the second element in that array. Now we have to find out whether both of these promises are resolving or not. If any one of them rejects, that means we are going to be uh, getting the rejected promise. But let's see what happens with promise one. So promise one, what it does is it says set timeout. It defines the function here and it asks JavaScript to wait for 2000 milliseconds before the set timeout function or the set timeout or the callback that you have provided here can get executed. In promise two, what you are doing is you again have done something similar. You are defining a function here and this time you are okay. So this is the same example. So this time you are asking JavaScript to wait for 1000 milliseconds or one second before this callback can be executed. So remember, Promise two is the second element and promise one is the first element. Promise one is resolving after two seconds. Promise two is resolving after one second. So both of these promises are resolving. That means the output that we are going to get is going to be a resolved promise. That is for sure. But in order to find the output, what is going to be the actual output? Because that is what we are printing here. One more thing to note here is that the output that we will get from this all function is going to be an array. That array is going to be a a collection of the values or the outputs returned by the individual promises that were provided in the i table. As I told you before, the sequence of the output outputs has to remain same. That means the sequence will be same as that of promises that were provided in this i table here. So since promise one comes first, the, we have to wait for this promise to get resolved until and unless, uh, or we can say that this promise dot all is not going to yield an output until then. So what we do is we will wait for 2000 milliseconds or two seconds. In that case, what it is going to return us is it is going to return us resolve one. So that means the output that is being returned is one. And if you talk about promise two, uh, then the output that is being returned is two. But this is being returned after one second. This is being returned after two seconds. But when we are trying to print this value RES, can someone tell me what is going to be the output just for RES? We are not talking about the whole program output. I'm just talking about the RES output. So this RES is what? This RES is the resolved value for the promise that comes from this promise dot all function. One comma two. It is going to be one comma two. Yes, correct. So since the promise two was resolving early, it does not mean that the output that it returns will come early uh, within the promise one in the output array. No. Uh, Output array has to maintain the sequence of the promises. So the first element in that array is going to be one that is written by promise one. The second element in that array is going to be two. So this RES is going to print one and two. But wait, this question basically asks us to predict the output of this program and not just this console.log. There are some other console.log statements in this program too, and they are defined inside these promises itself. Now I want you to answer that which of these console.log statements will be executed first. Promise two. Promise one or promise two? Two. It will be two, correct. Because we know that this promise is resolving before the first promise does. So that means this promise is resolving, this console.log statement will be executed. This statement is getting executed. However, the result of it is being put into the array at the second element. That is a different thing. But it is finishing its execution before the first promise does. So the very first output that or the very first message that will be shown on the output screen is promise two is done. After that, after waiting for one more second, this promise will also complete its execution and it is going to display promise one is done. So till now, the sequence of outputs is promise two is done, promise one is done. At last, when both of these promises resolve, we come here. Uh, uh, this promise dot all result, uh, returns a single promise that also uh, gets resolved. And it resolves with a value what? It resolves with a value that is an array. Uh, that array has two elements. Since we provided just two promises in this uh, iterable, the first element is going to be one. The second element is going to be two. So in that case, the output is going to be promise two is done, promise one is done, and an array having two elements, uh, one comma two. So promise one is done, promise two is done, promise one is done, promise two is done. Promise two is done. So the fourth one is going to be the correct answer. So were you all uh, able to understand this question? What is happening in it? Understand, sir. But just a quick question. Did we encounter promise all 
before in the course i couldn't find it in the graded assignment or whatever so i skipped this question no it was not it was mentioned before i maybe i missed it no 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 it was not okay all right uh, uh, so basically is the flow of control here and how the how the control is flowing okay i am assuming yes so let us move to the next question so again this is a view related question we have to fill in two placeholders code one and two which can be used in okay this is a view x store to update the students state variable with the objects of students retrieved from the database to update the students state variable that is here with the objects of students retrieved from the database okay we have to fill in the code one and code two okay so i hope code one you all will be able to answer very quickly since we are using an async function here and we are making a fetch call there is only one component in the entire view in store that allows async functions and that is what actions those are actions yes so code one is going to be actions let us see Okay, so there are two actions, uh, second option and third option. Let us see what has to be written in code two. So here, what we are doing is const response is what it is. Uh, basically, the response from this fetch students. So this is going to get us the list of those students in data. And once we get this data, okay, we have a mutation here. So we will be invoking this mutation. That is add data mutation. Yeah, action is going to commit the mutations. So in that case, which is going to be the correct option? Do we dispatch mutations or do we commit mutations? Commit. We commit mutations. We use dispatch for invoking the action functions. So if we have a context object, that means it is coming from the action function. So we will be using context.commit in order to invoke a mutation. Add data is the name of the mutation that has to be invoked. Data is the parameter that is to be provided to that mutation function. So the third option becomes correct in that way. Any issues with this question? Okay, this was an easy one. So yeah, I guess it is clear to everyone. Uh, yeah, so the next question is a theory based question. Which of the following statements is true regarding local storage? The local storage for a given domain automatically gets cleared after a system reboot. The local storage for a given domain automatically gets cleared. Okay. Uh, what do you think about this option? Is it true? Is it false? I guess we discussed about storage objects in one of the live sessions in detail. Okay, so the local storage is kind of a persistent storage. That means it won't be deleted until and unless it has been deleted manually or it is manually deleted by the user. Okay. That means it will persist for lifetime. That means doing a system reboot is not going to make any impact on the local storage. So the first option is not a correct option. The local storage objects for a domain and its subdomain are the same. I guess this is one of the related questions too, if I can remember correctly. But that was asked in a different way. That means I guess that question was that the local storage of a domain can also be accessed by its subdomain or something like that. So that option is also not true because it cannot be directly accessed. Third option is one can store JavaScript objects after stringifying in local storage for a given domain. And the fourth option says the local storage is not supported by Internet Explorer. So the remaining two options are third and fourth. What do you think which one is correct and which one is not? The first two options are false. We have already discussed those. So third one is correct, but uh, not sure about fourth one. Yeah, local storage is uh, supported in uh, what I say in the Internet Explorer browser too. Maybe you can just go to MD at once. Uh, one second, let me open it.
okay mdn does not say anything about uh, the edge or the internet explorer browser yeah but i have tried this thing so it is basically accessible that means we can use local storage in internet explorer browsers too okay so the third one is a correct option here okay so yeah maybe we would have seen that if we want to store some complex objects in the local storage or in the session storage uh, if we don't stringify them then what we will be storing in those uh, uh, local storage or session storages is basically something uh, that cannot be interpreted in the way that we intend it to that means it will be stored something as object itself with the name object itself in the storage and when we try to retrieve it we won't get any value that we try to store that time so in that case we will have to stringify the object and when we are retrieving it back in case we want to interpret it as an object we will have to pass it again in the form of an object uh, sir uh, can okay. i ask one question yes, yes sure so what is the difference between like the use cases of uh, promise.all and promise.all settled promise.all settled uh, uh, currently i do not have a complete idea about settled i just have a clear definition in my mind i have to check that first okay sir maybe in the last we can discuss yes yes sure so which of the following statements is that true regarding view x uh, view x provides state management functionalities to view application i hope all of you would be able to answer this question or even guess this question by now uh, uh, sorry this option uh, a view application cannot be built without using vuex okay we have to select all of the true uh, options so second option is false because we ourselves have uh, developed applications without using vuex at all so second one is not a correct option actions should mutate the states instead of committing the mutations the way around right actions should commit the mutation that's how we get the exactly so this is basically the ideal flow that actions should commit the mutations and mutations in turn should make the uh, state change so third option also becomes incorrect the getters in vuex comes handy while computing a derived state of stored data so getters in vuex are something similar to uh, what we or maybe computed properties in some sense in the view instance because we use getters in order to get a derived state of uh, some state object in case we want to get the same state object then we can directly even access it but getters are generally used for that purpose in case we want to get some derived information of the purpose so the fourth option becomes correct in that sense uh, is that okay shall we move to the next question yes sir so the next question is regarding uh, the http verbs i guess the use of http verbs is generally discouraged while defining rest api endpoints what do you think so i guess this is again one of the practice or graded based questions i am not able to exactly recall so the the third one i mean i could understand it but uh, maybe you can describe it a bit more um, the third one okay yeah we'll come on to that yeah so what about the first one the first one is actually the other person, way right the opposite this is usually encouraged first one is correct no that is first one is correct right. yeah so okay we have to select the false statement in this question okay the first one is basically correct so that is not the correct option of this question uh your public linkedin profile url is an example of a permalink what do you think how many of you use linkedin but yeah i know i know the answer to this yeah i will, I will wait for others <laughs> how many in the session use linkedin here i use that's why i know the answer to this so i know this is the correct answer for this question <laughs> uh, yes sir okay you use linkedin okay yes yeah, sir i use linkedin so what do you think about your profile url do you think there is any chance that so, we sir, can get changed in the linkedin profile our username is there so not a like a unique string so that is why i think it is not a permanent link so if i change my username the link will also be changed profile url will be changed 
Okay. All right. So that's why this is the correct answer, uh, answer for this question. Well, if we talk about the third question, uh, the third option, sorry. A request is cacheable in general when the response can be regenerated just after seeing the request URL. Uh, so, okay, let me try to, uh, you know, just give some more details. So, see, when we are trying to, you know, do some caching for any of the endpoints in our application, that caching is generally done at the proxy level. It is generally done at the proxy level so that the request does not hit the backend servers again to give the same response. Well, again, those backend servers can also cache that somewhere and can give the same response. But in order to prevent that request, uh, you know, uh, to go to the backend servers and hit those in order to get the cacheable response, we generally do caching at the proxy level. And when we are doing something at the proxy level, so remember, anything in the request body is not visible. Right? The request body will not be readable by the proxy at all. So that's why if the proxy is able to take a call uh, based on the request URL that it is able to see at that moment, then you can say that it becomes more easy for you to cache that request in general. Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess you understand. Okay, so the response is always cached. No. Okay, when, Why when, it all, when request is cached, what does it mean? The response of the request is cached, right? Yeah. With the you request always cached. You are saying always cached. No. What I meant is, suppose I put the cache token, cache uh, uh, decorator, right? Okay. So what I am actually storing in the cache is the response I generated. Response, exactly. Yes. But that is what. So, but is the request also put as a key there? Yes, of course. There should be some key because uh, we studied it in, you know, I guess Narendra would have shown you in the caching session that how does it get stored in the Redis server is there is some key and the value that, uh, to that key is going to be the response that is uh, to be returned whenever the next request comes. So that way this question is asking, so suppose then I get a different URL, same endpoint, but the ID is different. Say, for example, I put get an ID one and next time I do ID two. So I know that this is a different request. So I have to basically redo, redo the part. It doesn't match any exactly. of the responses. So I have, have to, yeah. Okay. okay. How many of you know about Wix? Maybe if any one of you has any page or even of you run any website or yes, this is Wix is just a site generator, right? Yes. Uh, something like Google Sites. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Wix is more used for thing. Like, I mean, people call it a different, uh, better exam, better version of uh, WordPress. Right? Yeah, it is definitely a CMS. Yeah. Definitely, yes. So I guess nowadays Wix is also giving us packages uh, that also includes web hosting and all. So it becomes quite easy. That means everything is there at a single place. You don't need to go for hosting and other things uh, looking at other places. So yeah, so this is an example of a CMS. And that's why it is also a correct statement, but a false statement with respect to this question. So yeah, the, the false statement for this question was it uh, is second. Is that clear? Shall we move to the next question? Yes, sir. So lot Next of question is related to you. Yes, sorry. I'm seeing a lot of theory questions are there, so it will be same in the exam, right? Uh, well, the weightage will be maintained between the theory and practice, or oh, sorry, programming based questions. There are not too much theory, or oh, okay, there seems to be too many. In the actual quiz exam, uh, there will be some balance between programming based and theory based questions. We will probably get less theory based questions in the quiz exam if I can remember correctly. Anyways, uh, let us look at this 12th question. Uh, I would hope that uh, one of you will be uh, able to answer this question. So, the simple question is what will be rendered inside the long term view for home and suits routes respectively? So, we have two routes, home and suits. What will be rendered for each of us? So for home, the home content or home uh, component will be rendered. 
okay home and uh, force are here so for home you were saying it is redirecting you to an object a name home so there must be some configuration in the routes this home oh, is component home yeah so it is going to be component home so it simply says this is home but what about the other one is fruits so fruit says that it is going to the fruit name component or uh, object and providing the parents value to be apple in uh, the f name param so when you come here so there is this f name parameter the value of this f name now becomes apple you go to this fruit component you come here this page is about routes.params.f name what do you think what the output should be this page is about apple so in that case it becomes this is home and this page is about apple the second question is the oh, sorry the second option is the correct answer any issues with this uh any issues with this question anyone well, in the routes why do we have to redefine i mean we have to include the colon f name again right that is the correct way to do it i think this was also the crux of the question the minus Fair, okay. sorry so because in the router link i have mentioned f name is being passed correct okay so but then that is being passed as a property that is okay. default yeah. property actually so we can also pass it by url if i am correct sir. so then we are doing two by... things this is going in the path that means it is going as a path variable like slash root slash something and then after that you can again put slash and can write abc so that is the path itself only or the url itself or we can say url variables there is something known as query parameter that comes after putting a question mark after the url so the right to that question mark is basically what we call as query parameters these are the url parameters yeah but the thing is we haven't defined that f name anywhere in this uh, code you are defining it no, here I think so. If I if I like go to the URL uh, slash root slash orange, then the output will be this page is about orange. But yes. we are not passing anything explicitly. That is why it is taking the default value as apple. That we define the router link. You can see as a uh, params. So my feeling was yeah, okay. the URL will be just slash root only. The apple because f name has not been defined anywhere. Right, so it will result to nothing. But since we are passing fruit also as a parameter, it will still uh, it will just get added to apple. So this is one big confusion. That is why I asked that question. Right, I got very confused with this how it is being done here. No, no. Here, as we just mentioned, that since we are explicitly providing the value of f name to be apple here. Now, if you change this fruits, just this text message here to something else. Let's say, okay, let's keep it as fruits only. But let's say in the what I say in the URL. Uh, after slash fruits, you write slash mango. What do you expect the output to be in that case? No, in the URL we are putting colon f name, and f name is not defined. Am I right in saying that? F name is not defined. I'm not. Can I can I answer this question? Yeah, yeah, so sure. I, I understood what he is saying. This this f name is a dynamic part. Like this is kind of variable. If you remember from the class, so whenever you create a route. you write a like angle bracket and inside the angle bracket you put a variable name so whatever the what i mean so when you visit a url then the the url will be like base url and then slash root and you will pass some value here so this part is dynamic so whatever the value you will pass here will be the value of the f name in that component like the component fruit so route dot params and then if name if you dot if name if you uh, like try to access it will be the value which you have passed here in the if name it's a variable if name is a variable so you can pass anything you want here like any string so the it's not predefined thing it's a variable
you understood what i'm saying you keep saying that the if name is not defined anywhere it should not be defined it's a variable so you if it's a variable you have to pass some value to that variable so i'll write it in the chat so see uh, right now if you see the path slash root and then colon and f name so if you'll uh, visit some url root i'll write it in the chat root slash like say mango so mango so this this will become the url and this part the mango the mango this this is the like value of this f name and not exactly the value of the f name this will be the value of uh, route dot params dot f name so if you will if you will uh, like access this variable route dot params dot f name in the component fruit in the component fruit the value will be value will be mango in some sense you are passing some data to that component through the url okay i mean so, this is the similar kind of thing which you used to do in the flask also so you create some dynamic part of the uh, of the url which you can like change okay sir i get it maybe i am i'm i'm maybe i'm very confused because see now i have defined the path itself to contain the name of the fruit yeah okay. but if you see above yeah. right the definition of the route link right so i am link. passing that as a separate parameter also so which i thought is a duplicate can you can you go to the router link so, then you must that is that is default parameter if something like we are not passing anything then to handle that particular thing we are just passing a default parameter okay got it so that is that way that's the default one and if i make it something else it will go to that part yeah so uh, sir uh, correct me if i am wrong so when uh, let's say i am just uh, routing to the url slash root and i am not uh, defining a default parameter over there in the router link yeah. then what will be the output it will be undefined right yeah undefined okay thank you because you are not giving any value to the f name just undefined the value of the route dot parent dot f name will be undefined so you just simply like imagine that this is the variable which you pass to a component through the path that's it uh to take up what viraj mentioned suppose i am sure that i'll always pass the path right then on the router link definition i don't need the params path right can you go up to the router link definition i don't need this default value at all right it should work even without that without the params it will work it will work but uh, in that case fruits is not a hyperlink that means you won't be able to get that output on clicking this fruits button if you are simply typing the url in the browser you will be able to get that but here since we had written fruits so we are just providing any default value that what the value of f name should be if the user is clicking on this particular link now what you can do is you can even create one more link here let's say with name fruits one in that case you can define f name value to be mango so if you click on uh, fruit one in that case you will be getting the output as this is mango or something so we are discussing for which line the line number Three. The router link two yes. name is equal to fruit. Params is equal to f name apple. It's not a default value. You are passing the value of the f name apple. So uh, it will be always apple. You are saying. Yeah. But whether I I will mention something in the URL or not, it will always be uh, apple. Okay. So whenever yeah. I click this link, it will be apple. And if I routing through the route. mentioning any the route then the value will be yeah it it will uh, like manipulate the route manually then it will be something else but this router link will generate the route like this the i'll write it in the chat 
fruit so clicking on this fruit yes. link will always give you this apple on yeah this you will not be, making any change in third line you are you are passing the parameter like this f name params is equal to f name apple so uh, th this is how you pass the parameter like uh, programmatically Oh, okay, sir. We got it now. So okay. if I hold a dynamic, yeah. dynamic kind of thing, I have to mention the URL. Yeah. Yes, Either you yeah. you write directly, or this is how you generate in some. You can say that you this is how you generate the uh, URL programmatically. So the name of the name is equal to fruit. So this will be the name of the route, and then the you pass the parameter f name is apple. So in place of the f name, it will. Uh, write the apple okay so in this case then there is no query right the question mark there is no, nothing passed no, out that. So that, the url for that will you be, have to write yeah. query so the, uh, this is the params this is the path this the params parameter is specify the path parameter and if you want to uh, write the query parameter also you will have to like mention the query parameter q u e r y this one query is equal to and it will also be a object like let's say you want to pass to query so you'll have to mention the object here so like this param cj object the query will also be an object so in that case the url let's say i'll write it in the chat let's say you are writing q u e r y query is equal to name is equal to let's say ajit and this is let's say you are passing this uh, query parameter query in the uh, in that object which is associated with the two okay then the parameter will become slash fruit i mean the path will become fruit slash apple and then question mark name is equal to ajit this is how the like the url will become okay sir got it okay so we'll i also try this i didn't get the time to because this is a later question right i didn't get time after the mark to try these parts thank you yeah i got this question quite wrong okay so i'll just say don't keep in mind that this is the default thing and you are passing the the value of the parameter f name mm, yes sir it is clear now thank you okay all right let us quickly uh, check the next question too okay it is based on a different thing all right questions so what this question asks for is suppose the application is running on this url what will be rendered by the browser when the user visits the url this for the first time excluding the button that will be shown so when the user is coming here for the first time uh, we'll have to see what the html is so there is this total there is this over and there is this edit score component so let's see what is in the total component there is some text so we'll see how that text will come up in the over also there is some text that is run current over and all in the edit score uh there seems to be only button okay so we can ignore this edit score component at least for now since we have to answer what will be the output excluding the button now if we need to find out what will be shown here in place of this total score we'll have to see that what it is so total score is what it is a prop what is the value to this prop the value to this prop is again a variable named total score or might be a complete property let's see so if we go to the view instance we see total score is basically a computed property here and what are we returning here is let's find out this dot over so this dot over means right now we just have one element in this over array reduce function i hope all of you remember uh, what will happen in case we try to run a reduce function over an array is a accumulator is this going to get the what do you say uh, this initial value that is zero and this b is going to get the first element in that array so a is 0 b is 100 what you are doing is you are simply adding those what it becomes is 100 plus 0 becomes 100 and since there are no more elements in the array this is the final value that will be returned to this total variable so finally this is what it is uh, this is what this computed property total score is returning so 100 is the value that is being passed as this total score value to this html here for the first time 
for the total score component the output that will be shown is total score this column and the value to be 100 now let's talk about over so in over we are again passing this over uh, as the prop here let's see what this over is so over is basically an array having one element 100 so if we come here in this over component what we see is we have a diff uh, which is having some margin and then we have this current over text and after that what we do is we basically run over a for loop over this okay array name over so what we are doing is we are iterating over this array name over and since right now there is just one element in this entire array so what will be shown in this over component is current over column the first value in this uh, array is 100 and after that we'll get this file so finally the overall output is going to be total score Column 100, current score, column 100, and this pipe. So, the third option is going to be the correct answer. So, uh, sir, uh, one question here. Yeah. So, sir, this uh, in keyword in the this v4 directive and JavaScript is completely different, right? Like, we are using uh, v4 run in over. So in JavaScript, in you, correct, correct. In, in yes, you this is how you use for yes, yes. This is like just uh, you are iterating over the arrays. So few has a different syntax. You can probably find out if you need to also get the indexes. Then you will have to use two variables here. Let's say index comma run. Then you will get index in the index variable. Okay. Okay. The third one is the like correct answer. In fourteen. Uh, in the same view application. Okay, so we have the same application, and this time we are asking the output for when the user clicks on the button add run six times. So this time we have to take this add run or this added score component into the consideration as well. So what is happening when you are clicking on this button six times? So what it does is at every click it is emitting an event named add run event. We have to see where we are capturing this event. So we are capturing this event here. And in turn, we are calling this add run function. So what this add run function is doing is, this is checking what the value of count is. So the value of count is true initially for the very first time. So the value is true. That means the first expression is something that will be executed here. So what you do is this dot over dot push six. That means over is an array, which is having just one element as of now, that is 100. What you do is you push an element six to that array. So now, the new array becomes 106. After that, what you do is you change the value of this count to not this dot, dot count. So it will become false this time. So you are just inversing it. The next time you click on it, this dot count is false. So this won't be executed. The second expression that is written after colon will be executed. So this time you are pushing four. Then again, you will change it or you will reverse it. So finally, after clicking six times on this count button, or sorry, not count button, on this add run button, I guess. Yeah, add run button. What will happen is you are going to push six times to this over array. First time you will push six, second time four, third time six, fourth time four, fifth time six, and sixth time you are going to push four. At the end, that means after clicking on this button six times, you are having seven elements in the over array 100, 64, 64, 64. This is how the array will look like. Now, if you have to find out what the value of this total score is, so this dot over dot reduce AB. So now, we have to add all of those elements. So we'll keep 100 and 6, 4, 3 times. So that will become 30. So this is going to return us the value 130. And in over component, if we'll see what it is going to print is, it is going to iterate over this array. So the first element in this array would be 100, 5, 6, 5, 4, 6, 4, 6, 4. All of these values will be separated by 5. So in the end, the output is going to be total score. This will be 130. This is what the computed property is returning. In case of over component, it will show current over 100, 64, 64, 64. All of these values will be separated by pipes. So uh, this is the correct answer. Thank you, sir. So if, sir, if we can take one more minute, if we go back to the yeah. the the div uh, the HTML code. Yes. Right? So again, multiple reuse of the over, no? So can you go up, go to the yeah. original HTML code? Yes. Yeah. So here, the first over reference is actually the component. Correct. 
the second is what the component will get as a prop correct yeah the third over yeah. what is it it is the value that is coming from the view instance so in view instance you have defined one data property to be over it is an n this is what that over is within those two quotes okay so that's why you said it is a array with initial value of 100 and then you are doing it okay So both of these questions are understood. Thirteen uh, and forty. Because the view also has a component over, right? It has a data over, component over. So will the yes. Java will actually will it resolve to only the data over, not the component over? Basically, the place where you are making use of those things makes sense, right? Right now, you are using this over within quotes. So when you are using something in quotes and that too with v uh, bind, so it gives a different meaning. That means it is the value that has to be taken from the view instance. I I understand the view instance. If we go down the view instance, hmm. it does a data call over. Yeah. It also has a component call over. Yeah. See that we come down like components. It's also call over. Yeah, yeah. I am able to see. Yes. But it will always resolve to data, not to anything else. So it will depend how are you using it. If you are using it in the HTML, you are simply using over. So that means it is referring to the component. But when you are saying app dot over, that means it is referring to this n. So sir, uh, to avoid this confusion, we can even ch change the name of this component. On, like I mean, the, in the inside the components object on the left hand side, we can change the name as well, right? We can change this to uh, over comp, over dash comp. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can do that. Yes. Yeah, so this is not a like big things renovation. I hope. Okay, so then after this view is instantiated, the view has a data element called over, hmm. a component part called over, which resolves to the yes. over component. Correct. So that is why I was saying, right? We, we sometimes we get very confusing. Uh, yeah, so we can change the names like, if you are getting more confused. So is that clear? This is the component as you mentioned. This is the prop or the property that you are passing, and this is the value to that property that must be defined somewhere in your view instance, either in the computed or in the what I say, uh, the data property. If that is okay, we can proceed further. Yeah, okay, sir. Okay, so last question, again, a theory based question. We have to find out the true statement out of these four. Both the local and session storage maintain separate storage areas for each given origin. Yes, it is true because local and session storage, they both are different. Session storage is something that vanishes after uh, the session ends, but local storage is persistent. So definitely they do maintain separate spaces. So it is a correct statement. It is not possible to access individual key value pairs, even if the keys are known. I guess I, uh, in one of the sessions, we discussed about uh, the local storage API or instead the storage API. So we have certain number of methods that, that uh, API gives us. So there is one method called key or something. I don't exactly remember. Uh, yeah, there are certain methods. Maybe I can just check uh, storage get key. Sorry. So, dot, uh, yeah, so we have this get item here. So when we yeah. pass the key name, we can get the key value. Yeah. So in that sense, the second option becomes wrong. It is possible. The session storage never gets cleared unless the user deletes it manually for a given origin. So that is something that is true for local storage, not for session storage. So third option also becomes false. None of the session or local storage can be inspected using the browser's developer tools. So I hope all of you know that we definitely can. All right. So the first option is the only true statement for this particular question. And yeah, that is it.
let me see if uh, we have left any question unanswered okay all right yeah so yeah please let us know in case uh, you have any questions now okay let me come back to that uh, settled Okay, so Vinash, uh, see that thing that I can remember right now is uh, that promise dot all. It is as I was telling you that it only gets resolved, or the promise that is being written by that all function, it only gets resolved when all of the promises resolved. But if I am able to remember correctly, that's not the case with uh, promise settled on. I think it even resolves if uh, any of the promises rejects. But sir. Uh... That is like promise dot any is there for that no? Okay, wait a minute. Let me check promise dot settle now. Okay, it takes an iterable for promises input and returns a single promise. This return promise fulfills when all the Inputs promises settle, including when an entry interval is passed with an array of objects that is correct. Okay, even the output is different this time. Previously, we were getting the output in the form of an array, and we were getting the exact same outputs, but this time it is saying that we get array of objects that describe the outcome of each promise. So I hope it will give us some output too. Let us see. Oh, no, it is not the same thing. Okay, yeah. here it is giving us those statuses. All right, so this is how it works. Uh, instead of getting this value that is being returned by the promise after being resolved, it gives us an object uh, having two values or two key value pairs, status, which shows the current status of the promise that is fulfilled, and the value that the promise resulted in. In case the promise is rejected, it is giving us the reason. I guess that answers your question. Because. So yeah. it has two differences. One is that it even results. Uh, uh, result promise, even when any of the promises that were provided in the iterable rejects, and the output format is changed. Too. Okay, sir. Thank you. So there are two differences. So now that I saw that, so that way promise dot all is like an AND function. Promise dot any is like an OR function. Roughly. Uh -huh. Yes, all right. We can say that promise dot alone expects each of the promises to be resolved. Then only it is going to give you a result promise. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, are there any other questions? So, you said if you can explain the course C or S cross origin resource. Okay, course. Yeah. Yeah. So, cross origin resource sharing. So, see, whenever uh, we are developing any websites or any backend, what we want is that our API or our data should only be accessed by the applications that we are writing or by only those contents that we are writing ourselves. So basically, what we can do with the help of courses, we can restrict or we can prevent some origins or some other websites to make calls to our websites or our backend. Well, there is one common example that I see is being used across uh, while explaining the purpose of this, you know, CORS. So see what happens is, let's say you are using LinkedIn or you are using Facebook. So what usually people do is they log in in their systems and they don't usually log out so that when they come again, they don't have to enter those passwords and username again and again. So they usually keep their session on for a long duration. Okay. Now what happens is one day you are trying to visit some 
uh, some uh, website that is not a trusted one, or probably some hacker would have created it to gain some uh, private information from you. Okay. Now, what happens is there is a link that you find very attractive or very interesting. Let's say that link is, you know, telling you that, uh, you know, you will be made the CEO of uh, the Twitter, the next CEO, just for a joke. Uh, all right. So let's say you click on that link. Now, what that link does is in the hyperlink or in the HRDF value of that link, what it does is it basically uh, gives the value of the delete endpoint that Facebook or LinkedIn uses in order to delete your account. Okay, so since you are clicking on it, all of the cookies that are required for you to keep signed in or you for you to keep logged in for Facebook or LinkedIn are already there in your browser. So what it is going to do is it is going to treat it as an authenticated request. And the moment you click on that link, it is going to immediately delete your account. Right? Because uh, their server will think that, of course, you are logged in and you are requesting your account to be deleted. So they want to be able to differentiate that whether it's an authenticated request or not. But if they apply cost there, so what they will be able to find out is that from what origin that request is coming. So if they will find a different origin, uh, you know, from that request is being originated from, so they will be able to immediately block that request and can say that uh, this response or this uh, operation cannot be completed because that request has come from some other place and not from uh, the front ends or the designs that, or sorry, the implementations that. Uh, we have used or we have it uh, deployed for using this method. So, are you able to get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, sir, got it. Yeah, but Viraj, I, I have one more. So, what happened? So, now, uh, you know, sir, uh, I, I thank you for also answering this. Shini wasn't here. Thank you for answering my, you know, how the system solicitation is done. Right. So, I was getting this course error. So, because I was doing from Windows and, uh, you know, Ubuntu, then I Changed everything, ran everything from Ubuntu, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Both the front end and the back end. So only yeah, the yeah. ports are different, right? Only but the ports are different. Okay. Because the back end is running in, you know, by, by default it runs in 5000. The front end got by it, default it. runs yeah. in 555. I was using the go live from VS Code, right? But why does it not pass the course? Because it is the same origin. Because course, you are trying to access your back end or any URL using JavaScript. And all of such requests are by default blocked by force policy. So even if you just put a simple, fair enough, simple Flask application, and you try to access that Flask application, like say using fetch call, using JavaScript, you want to be able to access that until and unless you append the force header in your response. Oh, so that is why if I use Insomnia, it works because Insomnia is not JavaScript. Correct. So, sir, if, how I, if I take the content type, if I just change the thing, uh, if I put a different uh, whatever. No, if I say it's no, not from JavaScript, the course will close. Yes, yes, it won't work. You will have to append the course header in case you are trying to access it using JavaScript. So that's why if you are making fetch calls, you will have to, you know, return those course headers uh, from your application from your API for sure. So, sir, you are saying the same origin request will be accepted. So, how do we define origin in course? Like, uh, what is uh, same origin? What are the conditions so, in which we define this the origin as? So uh, when you use that Flask course module, so there is, uh, uh, so, you know, while creating an instance of that course, because course is the uh, class that you basically inherit from that particular package Flask underscore course. So when you are creating an instance of that course class, there you can basically define a regular expression. Regular, regular, like okay. Yes. So by default, if you don't define anything, that means, this can be accessed by every, every JavaScript module or any other application. Okay. So that regular expression will restrict the URLs like which are accessing yes. that particular application, right? Correct. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, similarly, if you can explain the use of um, GraphQL like with a practical example. Uh, so practical example, uh, okay, right now. Okay, GraphQL will be used by some organization who thinks that, uh, okay, uh, well, basically, I, I hope you understand that uh, there is basically a general problem. Uh, 
for which we use GraphQL so that we can resolve that problem. That is basically under fetching. That means, let's say if you have an API endpoint, what generally happens is that if you are asking, let's say for a person's detail, so a REST API endpoint is going to return you the entire person's object in general. Of course, you can modify your backend definition and you can just return, let's say, the name or the phone number or whatever you are required. But in general, I'm assuming that you are going to return the entire object by, uh, you know, JSON, JSON finding it uh, somehow. That you can, I guess, yeah, uh, do uh, by any other way possible. So this is basically a common problem. Let's say a person has ten other attributes, but you just need the person's name and the person's phone number. However, in the person resource, you have ten other attributes that are present. So when you are requesting the same information, let's say for thousand different persons, so those ten attributes is something that is not required for you or for your front end to be shown. So that is some, uh, one, I would say, unnecessary information. But still, exactly. it would be taking some space. It would be, you know, impacting your performance in some sense. Maybe some by some micro milliseconds, but it would definitely. Be. So in that sense, what you would be wanting is that you should be specifying the exact schema that you want the application or the backend to return. So this is what you can do quite efficiently with the help of GraphQL, where you can design uh, the schema of your request or what type of response do you expect from the server. So in that case, you won't be getting anything other than what you have requested. For. So if you have just requested for the person's name and phone number, the other details won't be returned. So instead of like fetching all the redundant data, I can only fetch the useful data. That will Correct. be the yes. load. But again, you have to probably give a deep thought whether you really require the use of GraphQL or not. Because for even for medium scale applications, REST works quite well. Okay, so if you're thinking, thinking about a small scale application, then I don't think you need to even think about GraphQL, even for instance. So this will be useful in like some if you design some sort of uh, search engine or maybe something like that, right? Because or maybe... some complex, yeah, where you are doing so many operations in a uh, very small span of time. Okay, so or where thanks. performance is a great concern for you. Okay, yeah, got it now. A minor question: uh, Will the coverage be similar? Um, in the, the quiz coverage be similar to the mock because there is fewer in the first few weeks. That is typically the thing, right? There is more focus on the weeks five to eight. It is generally the pattern. Yes, the focus will remain more on weeks five to week eight because weeks one to four have already been tested in quiz one. So you may expect maybe one question is from weeks one to four, or probably five questions in total. But yeah. The emphasis will be on the uh, questions from weeks five to eight. So, right, most four or five questions from the first four weeks. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, I believe no, so let me stop sharing. Uh, I'll quickly stop the live streaming for the session two. Oh, Narendra, can you please stop the live streaming? Uh, Narendra, are you there? Yeah, he's there, but I don't know. So I will ask a question, sir. It, is, I mean, it, it can be in the live stream also. So the next yeah, week, sure. uh, we are planning a project session again, no? Sometime Friday or something. Correct, correct, yes. So it has not been put in the calendar yet, but we can expect it. Yeah, definitely. It would happen. But yeah, as I told you last time, that uh, the schedule for this won't be fixed because this will be something that will be dynamic in nature. We may have it on Friday, on one week, or probably on Saturday or some other week. Okay, sir. 
and then the next one i was want to ask you that question after the live stream is stopped <laughs> but uh, i will go ahead and ask uh, because we have also written i'm one of those I mean doesn't apply since i because it doesn't apply to many people right about the project deadline for the people who might go to degree so we had written uh, to the support team to see if it can be extended or some concession can be given and uh, i thought i just mention it uh, because i felt that uh, you know have you have you received any response and written they said sorry um, so it was a very curt response i have requested an escalation and i have said that see the typically the thing is that the people who are making this request right also have put in their time right because see i have i started from january and uh, you know i have done four courses three courses mm. so finished yes, them all yes. only then i am in the situation to even make this request right so these are students who have actually put their time and dedication so i thought uh, it can be given a pass of course it is a favor only right it is not a right it's a favor so in regulations we call it forbearance right so we call it a forbearance uh, i mean you know the rule is there but because of a specific situation okay we will you know uh, let you you know or we will not implement the rule for some set of people right and maybe one more term this might be needed after that i think people will be okay because uh, the thing because even when i started may term right i didn't know about this project part right so this is where we got into the situation right if you had known about this my response after ending the live stream let me just call narendra okay yeah. Is that him? I'm not. I'm calling him. Some an unclosable live stream. 